Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du Fred Astaire uh, you also speak about how, you know, after we had this recession in 2007, 2008, you know, obviously it was a, there was a part of that crisis that was very real, but there was also a part of that crisis that was manufactured and limited the personal recovery of regular Americans. What did you mean by the manufactured? This is just real, and it was geographically unequal. And this is something that Trump, you know, unfortunately did understand is that, you know, in the heartland, outside of these sort of rich coastal enclaves, you did have real pain. You had a lack of jobs, a lack of opportunity, an inability to get by. What corporations did, though, is take this idea of the recession and of the recovery and basically just decided to stop paying people. That's something I discussed quite a bit in the book. They had unpaid internships, unpaid labor. They made that kind of a normal expectation, even though it's extremely exploitative. And it became a restructuring. You know, they said, oh, it's the recession. We can't afford it. Oh, it's we're still recovering. We can't afford it. And they did that as a way to, um, you know, limit the labor pool to the most elite, to the most advantage, and that, you know, creates problems. As I say in the book, a false meritocracy breeds mediocrity, and unfortunately, I think we see that in our political <laughs> Yeah, I think so, too. Today, so. You, uh, so you actually, you know, you have a PhD, mm -hmm. um, you know, you obviously had come from the part of academia where people would say, oh, this is an incredibly qualified candidate for employment, but you found that that is actually, can be a barrier as well, to, to have gone through academia the way you did. Yeah, I mean, I, I got a PhD. Um, I studied the former uh, Soviet Union. I studied authoritarian states. So that, I just want to make sure your PhD <laughs> like, is in authoritarian it's, states. It's in anthropology. It's in political anthropology. Um, I studied how dictators uh, use the internet for um, propaganda to manipulate trust. Uh, oh my to, God. To some expression. I, I studied Uzbekistan in particular, you know, just this dictatorship ruled by this very kleptocratic leader who abused government privileges to enhance his personal wealth, had this fashionista daughter who was always getting involved the state of fair. I mean, you know, nothing obviously to do with our current climate. So I imagine when you were doing this, people were constantly like, Sarah, what are you going to do with your Uzbekistan education? Yeah, and unfor unfortunately now we know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I came out of academia. Um, you know, I, I started in journalism, that industry collapsed. I went to academia, that industry collapsed. And now I'm in this industry where I study how things collapse. Um, but yeah, uh, academia is another industry that has this, you know, systemic labor exploitation. And I think you see that in almost any intellectual field, in policy, in academia, in media, um, in entertainment. Uh, you know, these, these are problems that we have. And what I don't like about it is it locks out a lot of talented people, especially mm -hmm. young people, you know, who are trying very hard, who've gotten all this education, taken on, on all this debt, and they don't have anywhere, you know, to go and express what they're able to do. So you study uh, sort of this dictor dictatorial uh, Uzbekistani re regime. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump shows up. How quickly in his campaigning did you, did it look familiar to you? Instantly. Okay. Instantly. I thought this guy is going to rule like a Central Asian autocrat, like a kleptocrat. I mean, and you know, I have to say Trump is an American phenomenon too. You know, we have predecessors, we have demagogues, we certainly have racist demagogues, but the idea that his primary goal is going to be to make money, things that he does like inserting his family 
firmly into the campaign, inserting them into the administration. Um, and of course, you know, it became kind of a literal thing of being tied to the former Soviet Union when he hired Paul Manafort, when all <laughs> yes. his ties with Russia were revealed. Then I was like, you know, what the hell is this? This is like when I had one of those surreal 2016 <laughs> moments where I'm like, did I die? And like literally every horrible thing I've ever studied has collided. <laughs> and, like, and now finally I have a job opportunity. Like, this is not how I wanted it to turn out. <laughs> You know. Well, we're lucky there was someone who at least had the tools to write about it. Um, you do write about uh, complaining. Oh, yeah. Because I think a lot of people now, you know, would say we're doing too much complaining. Mm -hmm. You sort of write a celebration of complaining and how it is a useful tool and, you know, a wonderfully democratic tool. Yes. So what is your, to explain what you love about complaining. Uh, well, complaining gives you a chance. You know, what every social movement, you know, started out as somebody complaining and that complaint getting dismissed. And, you know, I get frustrated when complaints dismissed because it's often a form of compassion. You know, you're looking out for other people. You're complaining about unfair circumstances. And I think when you say to someone, oh, stop complaining, that's an assumption that their social position is more important than that person's pain. And so I encourage everyone to complain, particularly under this administration. You know, let your feelings be known. And, you know, on a serious note, I, I do study dictatorships. I have friends who've been locked up for having the kind of conversation that we're having right now. It's nothing to take for granted. Freedom of speech is absolutely nothing to take for granted. Uh, social justice is something that we should fight for. So if you can speak out, you absolutely should. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm sure... I'm sure he's at least looked into locking us out. Just uh, so you know. I, yeah. I believe he's outright said it. I mean, you know, I'm an enemy of the people. I'm a member of the opposition party in Bannon. I mean, they've been very explicit. And, you know, we we have a different society, obviously. We have a tradition of free speech, an expectation of free expression. Technically, we have a constitution that's supposed to be followed, although apparently Trump and his cohort think they're immune from it. But, you know, I do worry about these things changing. You know, I, I don't take any opportunity to speak out, especially on the behalf of somebody more vulnerable than me um, <clears throat> in a worse situation than me. I never take that for granted. So I want to ask about the one thing that seems the saddest to me is, you know, you talk about all these sort of root issues that were in this country and that Donald Trump used to get elected. And yet Donald Trump now has become this sort of daily circus that those root issues are now exactly as ignored as they were before right. the election. Yeah, no, that's very frustrating to me, too, because whatever happens with Trump, um, the systemic problems are going to be there. And, you know, I think what's happened is now we have problems we never thought were coming. Now we're, you know, wondering if we wake up in the morning, like, will Guam still be there? Like, we're worried about nukes. We're worried about Nazis. But underneath it all are, you know, systemic racism, economic inequality, a bias. All the things that I, I discuss in this book are there, and they've been exacerbated. You know, Trump and the GOP are stripping away the social safety net. People who were having a hard time you know, two or three years ago are having a much worse time now and, and are probably in for worse times to come, um, you know, unless we do fight this administration. You know, we're in a flawed democracy that's moving to a burgeoning autocracy. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very concerned about that. It is Thursday, the 26th of April of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is... Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. It's a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. That's right. Hey, did you hear that the jambalaya, the, what they called jambalaya that they served at the state dinner with Macron, didn't have any fish in it? There was no seafood, no fish. What, what the hell? What kind of jambalaya is that? I, <laughs> there's something terribly wrong there. Terribly wrong. And I got to tell you, the McDonald's fish poulet is not really quite the substitute. Right? I, I got to tell you. And you think you think it's haddock? Uh, yeah. Well, it's something pressed. That's for sure. Well, Sarah Kenzier uh, went on uh, that show. Seth Seth Myers is that his name? I, I I don't watch those shows anymore. The late night shows. I'm too busy. But. Uh, yeah, she uh, she states that if she's on TV, there's something terribly wrong with America. And, uh, you know, and Sarah actually is another great example of, uh, of of the argument against all those people who say, hey, 
These people are taking these obscure classes, majoring and getting degrees and graduate degrees in these obscure disciplines. Oh, my God. The, the destruction of our society is because people are going after the obscurity. Uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, all we need. Uh, because, yeah, she was in, an, uh, I guess, an obscure field. Uh, the study of authoritarian regimes. Um. I don't know why that would be considered obscure, but uh, there you go. And uh, and suddenly, she, I, after however long, a decade or more, uh, couldn't get a job, couldn't couldn't get a journalism job, couldn't get a teaching job, and now suddenly uh, she's the go-to expert because uh, of her in-depth academe. And uh, good for her. So, uh, also, um, I th there was no way to turn things around, but uh, uh, she did go off on uh, uh, Morning Joe today and essentially accused them of being part and parcel to, uh, uh, you know, the rise of Trump. And, of course, you know, M Mika, if you, when you look at the tape, watch the defensive posture. Oh, my God, she's just mad at that woman. Mika is just mad at that woman. How dare you say that? He may be he may be an odd fellow, but you you don't say that. And you certainly don't say that, that we are responsible for giving him a bunch of free airtime and uh, hailing him from on high until they turned on him. They being Mika and Joe. And uh, uh, she was uh, she being Sarah was not going to let uh, them get away with it, and good for her. So, uh, you know, Sarah did touch upon another aspect about you know what's terribly wrong with America: unpaid internships. Give me an effing break! I was against it when it first. Came. You, <laughs> it's indentured servitude. What the hell? You pay your interns like. You always have, you know, the, the corporate America put this unpaid internship when they were like getting all sorts of tax breaks and reeling in money and some deregulation, which just goes to show that they are not corporate citizens. They are simply corporations and uh, like uh, any lizard brain thing or whatever. It's just it just eats and feeds and grows. That's all it does. There's no mind behind it. Oh, I know the argument of the people inside the corporation become the moral structure of it. Well, then why is are corporations across the board fairly morally corrupt when you look at the day-to-day -day aspects of what they do? I mean, how is it that a law firm, for instance, that advocates for the poor, aged, and disabled would fire someone who was poor, well, not necessarily poor, but, but disabled, for instance. I mean, that, how does that happen? It happens. So, ah, the world's a very confusing thing. All sorts of, um, you know, contradictions. Indeed. Well, uh, speaking of contradictions, Ronnie Jackson has uh, pulled his name uh, from the nomination process. And I'll tell you why. Be, he'll, he will tell you why. It's because it's brutal. It's just brutal. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if you're an angry drunk, it's going to come out. And it did. So uh, uh, he's out. And uh, who knows who's going to come in because uh, when the previous guy was kicked out on Twitter and Ronnie was installed on Twitter, um. Was there any mind involved in that? Was that just a reaction, a lizard brain reflex? Yeah, well, inquiring minds already know the answer to that question. So, Ronnie, uh, you know, good luck. Uh, your your military career doesn't seem to be faring very well either, considering, uh, you know, the out-and-out -out, uh, uh Overt criticisms from uh, military types who are even above you in rank. There it is. Well, bye bye, Ronnie. Oh, and uh, let's see here. Oh, well, 
Trump went on Fox this morning and uh, said Michael Cohen was his lawyer and handed out that hush money to Stormy Daniels. And uh, uh, (laughs) he's such an idiot. (laughs) He really such an idiot. And Fox, they just they really try to help him. And uh, Fox and Friends looked a little bit crestfallen, like, you know, should we turn it off so he doesn't get himself in any more trouble? And they just had to sit there and take it. And they, they were sad. They, they, well, sad. They, they, they were, some people are describing the uh, look on their face as, this guy is an effing loon. What the F are we doing? And uh, that might be a more adi- uh, approx- approximate uh, uh, assessment of uh, what they were really feeling. Oh, Jill Stein refuses to turn over campaign documents to the Senate Intel Committee because uh, she doesn't really need to. The FBI has them all already, you know. And, uh, Jill, they know what you did, okay, just so you know. All right, well, what are we going to attend to today? It's another big news day, as they always are. You think that it's not going to be, and then it does. Well, on the rest of the menu... A secret recording reveals NFL owners feared Trump would attack them for giving Kaepernick a job. Home of the brave, my ass. And these are football owners who are supposed to be, well, I don't know. I guess go back to Rome and look at the owners of the Gladiators. I guess they felt the same way. Don't you dare show a you a human uh, face to me, you automaton. Get out there and die for me and and uh, let me enjoy it, okay? Shut up. A white Arizona Republican quoted a rapper's racial slur to discredit a protesting teacher. So the legislator's only two black members were reprimanded for criticizing her. Free speech, I guess. And... The GOP's pathetic new pitch to voters is to cut Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, (laughs) they think that's going to work. After the break, we'll move to the chef's table, where one of Trump's top lobbyists was just caught fundraising for a friend of Syria's dictator. Yeah, we know who that guy is. And incels are wildly celebrating the Toronto van attack. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. go to the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com, you'll notice the chat room link on the right, and Kelly Lincoln, Roaring Girl, monitors that, so that's a, a good way to, to uh, maybe talk to us in real time. Uh, she's not always monitoring it, but she does monitor it very frequently, so do. Uh, to the left dish are the contribute donate buttons, and we are unable to do this without you, so thank you for your generosity. The The lights are on, so that means the bills are paid. Woo-hoo. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio, and uh, Tom takes care of that. And uh, we're on Facebook, and uh, uh, I sometimes, I don't often go there. I don't administer the page. Maybe I should. But, uh, uh, yeah, we're there also. If you feel like going there, that's okay. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam and our uh, the, the show notes and links for West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy are published oh, about 10 minutes before showtime. And that's on Daily Codes, of course. And you can find me on Daily Codes as Justice Putnam. All right, starting off here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, is an article by Travis Geddes out of Raw Story. Uh, Let's see, NFL owners all but agreed they were blackballing Colin Kaepernick to appease Donald Trump, according to newly released audio recordings. 
About 30 owners, players, and NFL executives met for nearly three hours in October to discuss Trump's public attacks on the league its pl- and his players over silent racism protests during the national anthem. And then Roger Goodall at the start of the meeting said, let's make sure we keep this confidential. Yeah. Now, according uh, to the leaked auto, players wanted to know why Kaepernick remained unsigned despite leading the San Francisco 49ers to the 2013 Super Bowl and the 2014 NFC Championship game. If he was on a roster right now, all this negativeness and divisiveness could be turned into a positive, said Philadelphia Eagles defensive lineman Chris Long at the meeting, adding that he wouldn't lecture teams on which quarterback to sign. We all agree in this room, as players, that he should be on a roster. Eagles owner Jeffrey Lurie told Long that fighting for social justice was not about one person, And New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft, a longtime Trump supporter, complained, this kneeling is another element, elephant in the room. You know, I've had this discussion with my own Trump bro. His attitude is that these are just workers and they should shut the F up and do what they're told. Now, of course, I will confess my Trump bro is a hard taskmaster in the uh, businesses that he's run, and he's very successful. And and an actor, too. He's parlayed his drive to uh, carve out a little niche there. And, uh, well, yeah, he's got something going there in Hollywood. Good for him. I think he's a friend of Abe. He won't tell me. But his argument in this is that these players are mere employees and they have no rights. Which is a complete misreading of what it is to be an American and what makes America great. And uh, my Trump bro, like a lot of others of his ilk, consider themselves to be devout Christians. So much so that they have to display their Bible on the dashboards of whatever, whatever large SUV that they have. Display it prominently. You don't go out without your Bible on the dashboard. You have to display your piety. <laughs> And uh, uh, they don't understand how kneeling is a respectful gesture. Well, we know why. It's because a black man is doing it. Okay, next offering here at the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is another article out of Raw Story by Travis Geddes. An Arizona Republican quoted a rapper's racial slur to discredit a protesting teacher, and the legislator's only two black members were reprimanded for criticizing her. Let me jump in and say real quick, white people, even if you're quoting Kendrick Lamar, do not say the N-word. Okay, especially if you're trying to make a point about, well, the black people use the N word and they're exotic. You know, you're a racist. Get it through your uh, bigoted head. Damn it. State Representative Maria Sims, repug of Paradise Valley. Oh, also all embellishments uh, here on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy are solely the domain of, uh, well, me, your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. I add a little bit of spice here and there, as you can tell. uh, Okay, she published a newspaper column claiming the two prominent leaders in the Red for Ed movement are political operatives who are leading a socialist movement to radicalize the state's youth. Well, how about this... uh, uh, Nazi socialist movement that you are being a useful dupe for, lady representative, white lady representative. 
What about what about the uh, radicalization of the youth from from this uh, uh, white supremacist movement that you seem to be wholly embracing? When lawmakers convened yesterday at the state house, State Representative Reginald Bolding denounced the column and told Sims she should have not used the racial slur. Well, uh, she had described uh, teacher Noah Carvalis's classroom as exotic and said he prided himself on sharing music with students by Pulitzer Prize-winning rapper Kendrick Lamar. So then she quoted a lyric that included the N-word. Now, Bolding, who was black, said, Let me be crystal clear. It is not acceptable to use racial slurs, even if that slur is used as a quote. Well, his floor was then interrupted at that point by State Representative Mark Finsom, repug of Tucson, who said it was improper for the Democrat to accuse another member of using a racial slur in an op-ed. The GOP majority ruled that Bolding had violated House rules, and Bolding asked for a voice vote on whether he should be silenced, and during that vote, the only other black lawmaker in the Arizona legislature also criticized Sims' columns, and she, too, was found to be in violation of House rules, and she asked for a voice vote on whether she should be silenced, and every white person there said, yes, shut the F up, you're black. How dare you accuse us of using a racial slur when we use the N-word, you N-word. Now, uh, Carvalis, the teacher, called the lawmaker's claims ridiculous and said he never used the racial slur that Sims quoted in his classroom. See, this is what they do. They tell a lie. They tell it again and again and again. Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays, is an article out of Share Blue Media by Oliver Willis. Republicans in Congress are pushing plans for their most unpopular ideas, even as the party faces major challenges in the upcoming elections. Yeah, let's gut Social Security and Medicare. That'll go over well. Congressional Republicans have released an election year proposal targeting massive cuts to government programs that millions of Americans, including the poorest people, have relied upon. A framework for unified conservatism, the proposal from the Republican Study Committee, a coalition of more than 100 conservative House Republicans, comes as the party faces the prospect of losing seats because of the unpopularity of the Trump administration. Since Trump's election, the party has already been forced to defend seats that have overwhelmingly favored Republicans in the past and has lost statewide elections in Alabama and Virginia. Now, uh, Tipper Nini uh, did lose her uh, uh, special election race uh, last night. And Lasco, what I got to tell you, is pretty much of a Looney Tune uh, tinfoil hat type and a bigot. But that really work, works well in Arizona, as you can tell. From uh, the legislators uh, censoring the only two black members of the legislature. <laughs> but, uh, and a lot of people are saying, but we really cut into uh, the numbers that Trump carried uh, then. Well, it's a pyrrhic victory, as they say. Okay, so the uh, uh, still now, the RSC plan pushes for doubling down on many of the party's least popular ideas and further associates Republicans and conservatives with proposals that are extremely cruel. Well, of course, they have to hurt. That's all part of, the, that's their, that's in their mission statement. 
We don't do anything unless it really sticks it to the least among us. Okay. The framework contains an attack on two of the most popular government programs, Social Security and Medicare. The Republicans often try to portray themselves as allies of the social safety net. Their new plan would end the promise of Social Security for Americans that turn 65, pushing them to wait until age 70 to receive their benefits, because that way maybe more will die and they don't have to pay it out. Okay, well, Paul Ryan did uh, specify that his life's work was to get rid of Social Security and anything that might help someone who needs the help. Because God intended the poor to suffer, and suffer they will. Okay, let's get to our break, and uh, then we'll come back and go through weather from around the world. And, of course, we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Before the internet or cell phones, radio or telegraph, long-distance communication meant riders on horseback, carrier pigeons, or semaphore. But various cultures also devised ways to produce audio messages that travel miles, like the sounds of the Mangware drums of the Bora people in the northwestern Amazon. The drums look like wooden cannons with a slit on top. A player stands between two of them and beats out a rhythm, either purely musical or a Morse code-like message. For example, bring the coca leaves for toasting. They uh, have this fantastic sound which uh, resounds uh, through the jungle and can be heard up to 15 or 20 kilometers away. Frank Seifard is a linguist at the University of Amsterdam and the University of Cologne. That extends uh, the range of the human voice uh, by about uh, 100. There's a drinking game in Bora culture. Who can drink the most kahuana, a non-alcoholic cassava drink? The winner might declare, I am finishing the kahuana. <laughs> or broadcast that boast on the drums. Seifert and his team analyze those beats and the corresponding spoken phrases and found that the pauses were related to the number of vowels and consonants in the phrases. And then depending on uh, whether the vowel is long or short and whether uh, there's uh, consonants intervening between the vowels, the pauses between the beats are going to be shorter or longer. The findings are in the journal Royal Society Open Science. Zeifert says studies of Bora drumming may ultimately reveal something more fundamental about spoken language. I think that shows very clearly how uh, this fine temporal structure of language, uh, this uh, rhythmic structure embedded in speech, uh, how uh, important that is for uh, language processing in general. In the early 1900s, Manguare drums were reportedly heard daily in this part of the Amazon. Today, only 20 drums remain, and the Bora language is losing turf to Spanish. But for now, the beat goes on. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day President Harry S. Truman signed Executive Order 9835. It is commonly referred to as the Loyalty Order. It required the screening of millions of federal civil servants and applicants. 9835 is considered one of the key preconditions for the rise of the McCarthyite Red Scare. It established a loyalty review board, a master index of those investigated, and definitions determining alleged disloyalty. Disloyalty could mean sedition, espionage, or advocating revolution. It could also mean membership or sympathetic association with 
with movements considered totalitarian, fascist, communist, or subversive. Soon, the Attorney General's list of subversive organizations was published. It amounted to a blacklist. In their book, The 50s, Douglas Miller and Marion Nowak comment, between the launching of his security program in March of 1947 and December of 1952, some 6.6 million persons were investigated. Not a single case of espionage was uncovered, though about 500 persons were dismissed in dubious cases of questionable loyalty. All of this was conducted with secret evidence, secret and often paid informants, and neither judge nor jury. Despite the failure to find subversion, the broad scope of the official Red Hunt gave popular credence to the notion that government was riddled with spies. President Dwight Eisenhower would revoke 9835 with his executive order 10450. But this order dismantled the loyalty boards by transferring power to federal agencies. It also expanded investigations to include those engaged in immoral or disgraceful behavior. This included what is considered sexual deviance and led to the witch hunting and discrimination against gays and lesbians in civil service. It's Tuesday, April 24, 2018. Mr. Hard has no clients that has business before this agency. Contrary to denials, lobbyists tied to EPA chief's condo did lobby the agency. So, yes, I'm going to send them a check for the monies that America had promised. Former New York Mayor Bloomberg donates $4.5 million to help U.S. keep Paris Climate Accord promise. Court reinstates fines for automakers that violate fuel economy standards, plus... Using natural thermometers such as measurements of tree rings and ice cores, man says he has been able to calculate ancient temperatures to a fraction of a degree. The 20th anniversary of the famous hockey stick graph. All of those anniversaries and more straight ahead. From bradblog.com, I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and... And snarky comment. But one thing is certain, the heat is on. Global temperatures for the first three months of 1998 were the warmest on record. Are we still playing that record? Yep. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, EPA Chief Scott Pruitt, leading our Green News Report Yet again today? Oh, yes, he is. New revelations suggest that Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt was less than forthright when defending his below-market rental deal from the wife of an energy lobbyist in Washington, D.C. In an interview with Fox News in early April, Pruitt claimed that renting from a lobbyist was not at all a conflict of interest. Why does it matter when the ethics officials look at the lease and the terms of the lease to determine whether it's ethical? Why does it matter? It's because you're renting it from the wife of a lobbyist. Yeah. Who has no business before this agency? Hold on a second, uh, Mr. Hart. Mr. Mr. Hart has no clients that has business before this agency. Turns out that's not true. What? The lobbyist in question, J. Stephen Hart, resigned from his lobbying firm on Friday after new lobbying disclosures showed that Hart did indeed lobby the EPA while Pruitt was leading it and was actually present in at least one meeting with Pruitt in an official capacity. So the lobbyist had to quit for doing his job. The EPA chief... He has yet to quit, even though he's wildly corrupt. Right. Hart denied that the meetings met the definition of lobbyist, but said he was retiring earlier than previously planned. (laughs) A small but growing handful of congressional Republicans have joined congressional Democrats in calling for Pruitt to resign. They can call all they want. Apparently, he's not answering the call. A win for consumers and the environment, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruled on Monday in favor of environmental groups by rejecting a Trump Department of Transportation attempt to delay fines levied on car manufacturers who violate federal fuel economy standards for cars and trucks. The fines had finally been updated to account for decades of inflation. In the meantime, the department has announced it plans to repeal those fines altogether. 
Meanwhile, former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg said he has volunteered to pay four and a half million dollars to cover a portion of the U.S. commitment to a United Nations fund to help developing countries deal with the impacts of global warming. That was part of the Paris Climate Agreement. The U.S. had pledged three billion dollars to the United Nations Green Climate Fund, but President Donald Trump reneged on that deal when he announced his decision to withdraw from the accord. In an interview with CBS News, Bloomberg said he feels a sense of responsibility. America made a commitment, and as an American, if the government's not going to do it, uh, we all have a responsibility. I'm able to do it. So, yes, I'm going to send them a check for the monies that America had promised to the organization as though they got it from the federal government. Well, he's going to send them four and a half million of the three billion that we had promised, but uh, we appreciate the effort. Indeed. Finally, this past weekend marked the 20th anniversary of the publication of the famous hockey stick graph by climate scientist Dr. Michael Mann and his colleagues in the journal Nature. Mann's study used tree rings and ice core data to reconstruct past climate temperatures and showed that the planet's temperature had been relatively stable for 500 years and then, in the 20th century, dramatically and suddenly spiked upward like a hockey stick. Here he is in a 1998 CBS News report. We believe we are seeing the effect of human beings on the climate of the 20th century. The graph's publication in 1998 also marked the launch of an unprecedented attack campaign funded by the fossil fuel industry that attempted to discredit Dr. Mann and all climate scientists in order to confuse and mislead the public about the dangers of global warming. Since the release of the hockey stick graph, the science of man-made climate change has only gotten stronger, as have the real-world impacts. And now the oil industry is beginning to face mounting climate liability lawsuits. And they continue to face Michael Mann, who continues to push back. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, please check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Don't forget, you can download our reports anytime via Stitcher, TuneIn, or iTunes. Find us, follow us, and share us worldwide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. And this has been your Green News Report. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I stand my ground. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. A day after President Trump called North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un, quote, very honorable. A top UN human rights expert is encouraging foreign heads of state to pressure Kim on his country's human rights record and not omit that uncomfortable topic during a coming diplomatic talks. Quote, a denuclearization deal will remain fragile if it sidelines the rights and needs of the DPRK population, Special Rapporteur Thomas Ojea Quintana said in a statement on Wednesday. Quote, the DPRK has proven to be a tough negotiator, and not even mentioning human rights at this very first stage of negotiations would be a misstep and a lost opportunity. Kim Jong-un is scheduled to meet with South Korean President Moon Jae-in on Friday, and it's been reported human rights concerns will not be on the two men's agenda. In a human rights report published in March, Quintana described a near total lack of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and access to information in North Korea, and he accused the state of widespread torture within its prisons. And faced with mounting evidence of resistance to anti-malaria drugs, Oxford University scientists are recommending the mass administration of anti-malaria drugs, whether or not those receiving treatment have contracted malaria or not. After blanketing a 7,000-square-mile swath of Myanmar with anti-malaria drugs, researchers observed an upwards of 90% reduction in new malaria cases in certain areas over a three-year period. In recent years, global health experts have witnessed a startling rise in malarial drug resistance across countries, including Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. While malaria remains more of a problem in Africa, where 91% of global malaria deaths occur each year, experts fear drug resistance could spread beyond Southeast Asia and set back malaria efforts in Africa within the coming years. While malaria is treatable, the mosquito-borne illness still claims nearly half a million lives each year. Luke Vargas, the United Nations.
you for accompanying us here to the chef's table of the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. And I just got to reiterate, I I really think that uh, Trump catered the state dinner and he used his kitchen at his building in the old post office there in D.C. I... <laughs> There's no other explanation for not having fish or seafood in the jambalaya. What? It's not jambalaya. It's it's rice. It's it's kind of a spicy rice. My God, some someone should be incarcerated for that. And I don't know. Trump will just pardon him anyway and say, "Bring me a McDonald's fish fillet." Jeez, oh my God. Do not eat the fish fillet. All right. On the other hand, maybe Trump should because uh, you know what the guy the guy's blood pressure was one fifty four over ninety one some exorbitantly high blood pressure. He's about two hundred and eighty nine pounds, and he's only uh, about six one if that. So uh, that's what happens when uh, the drugs wear off. Uh, you know the ones that the doctor took. Jeez. Says, oh, 89. It looked like a 39 when I was blasted out of my brain. Here, give me a drink. Okay, enough of that. Well, uh, now that you are comfortable in the, at the chef's table here, let's uh, talk about weather from around the world. And we always begin weather from around the world. Along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 51 degrees here at the mothership for Netroots Radio. That's right. Here at the uh, the upper reaches of town, just before Ponderosa Park. Uh-huh. Right there along uh, the divide between the wild and the town. And uh, we're a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler. Uh, it's nice. And uh, we have a very parkland setting here. At the mothership, at positively Third and Marie, by the way. So, uh, very nice. I've got most of the planning, most of the planning down. I've got a couple of specimens that uh, I'm going to manicure for, and I'm going to make a little rock garden, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, build a little four foot curved bridge. My mom's been, been uh, hankering for one of those, so maybe I'll do it and call it a Mother's Day gift. Here, mom. And uh, better than making her an ashtray because she doesn't smoke and hasn't since uh, the 80s. Good for her. Too bad she had to smoke to begin with, but at least she's quit since the 80s. Still has to have breathing treatments, but could have been worse. So, uh, yes, we've had fairly nice weather, and we will continue to have nice weather. We're going to go up. We're going to be a lot cooler than we were yesterday. We were well over 90 yesterday, and we're going to have a precipitous drop to 85. Uh Uh-huh. Springtime in Southern Oregon. That's why it's Ponderosa Park, just on you know, right right above me here. So, uh, uh, you know, the Cartwrights probably rode through here at one point. You never know. Okay, so winds are out of the east southeast, about three miles per hour. They are going to be shifting here about noon out of the northwest at five to ten miles per hour, and we will have increasing possibility of rain throughout the day. And then we're expecting about a quarter inch tomorrow, starting tomorrow morning or tomorrow night uh, or tonight, I mean, because winds will then be out of the west at five to ten miles per hour tonight. And uh, yeah, increasing possibility of rain tonight, but showers in the morning and winds will be out of the west at five to ten miles per hour tomorrow morning. And uh, we are expecting about a quarter inch of rain tomorrow. And then uh, Saturday, another quarter of an inch. Uh, Monday, we're expecting a little bit less than a quarter of an inch. And then, uh, I'm sorry, Sunday, a little less than a quarter of an inch. And then Monday, about the same. So we will have a spot of rain. And uh, my garden will love it because minerals from the sky are always better than what you can take out of your hose bib. Okay. Oh, another uh, little suggestion. Probably not wise to water from... The uh, drinking water that you have, you know, the tap in your house, better to use the outside hose bib to water with. And uh, some people will say it doesn't matter either way. But uh, for the same reason, you really don't want to be drinking out of your hose bib. 
is the reason that you would water your plants with it. Okay? Do that. Pressure. Oh, we are experiencing high pressure at the moment, though it seems to be falling at 29.91 inches. Visibility is at 10 miles or more, actually. And uh, humidity is 83%. So, yes, this uh, storm from the north is wending its way down. Oh, I should mention that when the rain comes, we will uh, drop into the upper 60s, low 70s for that uh, spate of rain over the weekend. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people live around the world. London is 58 and fair. Paris is 62 and sunny. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Rome is 77 and sunny, and that's just equally as perfect as well. Uh, Let's see. Kiev is 71 and fair. Kabul, 69 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong, 70 and partly cloudy. Tokyo, 63 and fair. Sydney, Australia, 66 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 58 degrees Fahrenheit and fair as spring in New York can be. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal purchased weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people live around the world. First offering here at the Chef's Table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, is by Noor Al-Sabai out of Raw Story. A man said to be one of the closest lobbyists in Washington to Donald Trump has been fundraising for a company linked to a family close to serious authoritarian leader Bashir al-Assad. The Daily Beast yesterday reported that the lobbying firm, owned by Trump lobbyist Brian Ballard, took on Dubai-based trading company ASM International uh, as a client as reported in last month's federal filing period. Now their name is ASM International General Trading is the client. In analyses of open source information, the Beast found that ASM is affiliated with a member of the Foz family, a clan of wealth and wealthy Syrian businessmen that are reportedly close to Assad. Ballard said that if uh, the uh, ASM is indeed tied to the Syrian dictator uh, the president has recently feuded with, he would fire them as clients. That's what he told the Daily Beast. We are going to do more due diligence. We're not the CIA, but if it were to turn out that there was any connection at all, we would withdraw from our representation of the Dubai Trading Company. I think what he means to say is that, damn it, we had a good thing going here, but you found us out. Damn, I got to figure out a better way to hide this. Uh, I'll get back to you. Thanks. Les pieds nus dans le sable Danser maintenant Et jeter vos ennuis dans les vagues Qui dansent all right, finishing up here at the Chef's Table in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is a maddening story by Luke Barnes out of Think Progress. The online community linked to Alec Manassian, charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder, has been celebrating wildly in the wake of his alleged van attack in downtown Toronto on Tuesday. The group of misogynists who, are, who self-identify as involuntary celibates, or incels, have praised Manazian, elevating him alongside Santa Barbara shooter Elliot Roger and Las Vegas shooter Stephen Paddock, two mass murderers 
who the community holds up as saints for killing normies or normal people. Their sick glee was only exacerbated by the fact that most of the victims of the Toronto attack were women, including an 80-year-old grandmother who was an avid fan of the Toronto Blue Jays and the Maple Leafs. Ah. This random dude killed more people than the Supreme Gentleman Elliot used, Crustesiosi said on the incel forum incels.me. I hope this guy wrote a manifesto because he could be our next new saint, another user said. And then even one more said he had one celebratory beer for every victim that turns out to be a young woman between the ages of 18 and 35. Yeah, they're definitely not normal. Boy. Okay, other incel users uh, on incel.me debated new ways to bring terror to normies, including pipe bombs, acid attacks, mass rape, and memetized uh, spamming of Elliot Roger and Alec Manassian, according to the website We Hunted the Mammoth, which monitors online misogyny. Moderators on incel.me, however, have distanced themselves from the attack, as well they should, because they could go to jail. I mean, we're talking Canada, all right? But in other quarters, the attention that the Toronto van attack has brought on incels has been greeted with jubilation. Normies have short attention spans. They would have lost interest in gawking at us like they were at the zoo by now, user Picapesso wrote. I knew we would gain a decent chunk of people who would agree with the black pill, which is the incel view of the world, but not quite admit it to themselves. We are still at 2,000 users. Our usual numbers are around 450 to 750. But according to Angela Nagel, author of Kill All Normies, the incels' jubilation will likely be short-lived. It is not a positive for them. It will only strengthen the case for shutting down their forums and potentially criminalizing them. I don't have sympathy for them. I can see that they're very hateful people. But I do think we need to be constructive about what drives people to become incels. The incel community is not explicitly political, but their group think and blaming the state of their sad lives on women and feminism, coupled with the fact that their communities are almost exclusively online, and that they prey on vulnerable young men, make them fertile recruiting grounds for the online far right. But while many far right friendly sites like The Red Pill, Traffic and Male Sexual Enlightenment, none have the nihilistic rage that characterizes incel communities. Ironically, the term incel was actually coined by a queer Toronto woman in 1993. Of course, <laughs> it always turns out that way, right? Of course, incels do not have a monopoly on horrible misogyny-based violence, either in Canada or the U.S., in 1989, for instance, 25-year-old Mark Lapine killed 14 women at the École Polytechnique in Montreal, Canada, specifically targeting feminists. Domestic violence and history of violence against women has also been a common thread for mass shooters. Well, I think uh, some fellows need to have, uh, I don't know, they need to be deprogrammed somehow. I don't know. All right, well, we'll try to deconstruct that and figure out a positive uh, strategy in which to, uh, I don't know, change the thinking of these these fellows because there's something terribly, terribly wrong, and it's obvious. All right, let's uh, close down here because we are at the end of our broadcast period for the day. Stay tuned to Netroots Radio throughout the rest of the day. We have live coverage, and any breaking news that may be breaking, we'll have it. And we may be breaking in live to carry whatever terrible things that Trump wants to impose upon us. So stay tuned to Netroots Radio, and we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert. 
et un tel été Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Don't leave.